It's May 12th, 2007. I'm at the home of Bill Bronson. It's about uh, 10 after 2 p.m. If you'd like to state your name, please. My name is Bill Bronson. And uh, what is your ethnic or racial background? I'm a white male, European descent. And what is your birth date? October 22nd, 1963. All right. And uh, where did you grow up? Several places, mostly in northwestern Ohio. Uh, I attended, I believe, four different schools uh, before coming to Ohio State for college. And those places included, after being born in Williams County, the northwesternmost county in the state, in Montpelier, Ohio, um, Delta in Fulton County, Bluffton in Allen County, Lima or Lima Bath, also in Allen County, and then Tenora, which is a rural school district uh, next to Defiance in Defiance County. And um, uh, who are your parents? That would be Bill and Mert Brownson. And do you have siblings? I have two sisters, both older. One, uh, Brenda, nine years older than me, and another, uh, Cindy, who is seven years older than I am. And... Uh, they uh, live in northwestern Ohio, my sister in Bowling Green, uh, sister Brenda, my sister Cindy is uh, mentally handicapped and lives in a group home about 20 minutes from my parents in Wauseon, Ohio. And um, when you were growing up, did your parents work outside the home? My father was a uh, public school superintendent for 35 years and uh, so that meant he worked outside the home a lot uh, when you add on the kinds of activities that go with that, all the athletics and music and uh, meetings and so forth. And my mother uh, worked outside the home, uh, I think before I was born and then as I was into um, high school. She went back to volunteering at Lutheran Social Services and then I think ended up creating a, a homemaker or a, a uh, an assistance program that helped the elderly and younger disabled stay in their homes um, as long as possible and that became a full-time job for about 10 years when I was in high school and college. What is your earliest memory? Mm. We lived in a rented farmhouse in the country outside of Delta and I have intermittent memories of that where I would have been probably um, four years old, maybe four and five, and um, just the kinds of things that four and five year olds remember. Um, you know, things that come to mind include, I guess there was a field fire behind the house one, one summer day, and uh, um, there was a, the, there were some buildings on the property that were farmed, including one as a uh, a chicken coop and I can remember uh, terrorizing the chickens by throwing rocks at the side of the coop. Those are the kinds of things I remember. All right. When, when you were a kid growing up, who were your heroes? Mm. You know, I don't know that I had anybody as a, as a child that I saw as a hero. I'm trying to think as mo in my younger years. Um, I remember things like uh, watching Neil Armstrong walk on the moon. I think that would have been when I was about six, perhaps. Uh, that was pretty impressive. Um, in the mid-70s, I enjoyed uh, professional baseball, and the Cincinnati Reds were actually good then. And at that time, I could name all of the starting lineup and their batting averages. And uh, that team had some really great athletes like Joe Morgan and Dave Concepcion and Tony Finn Perez. Um, I was a football fan, so you know it's always fun to watch Ohio State football, people like Archie Griffin. So that was interesting. Uh, but I don't know that any of them would rise to hero status for me. All right. How old were you when you realized that you were different than the other kids? Mm. You know, I probably figured that out in um, late elementary or junior high at the latest. 
And what was it that you realized? What part of you was different? Well, I guess the, the part that was different was uh, I didn't understand and certainly wasn't feeling the same attractions toward girls that other peers uh, were, and um, which seemed a little strange. But other than that, uh, that's probably the, the distinction. Did you talk with anyone about it at that time? No, I don't know that I remember talking with anybody about it. I had a, in junior high, you know, when and you, you experiment and you, you do things, uh, uh, a neighbor kid, and I don't know to this day whether he's actually gay or not, um, but there was some exploring, you might say, that went on uh, then. I might have been seventh grade. But then nothing for 10 years at least. Uh, so um, that's what I remember about that. When you were growing up as a, as a, as a kid, um, did you ever hear other people speak uh, about gay people, somebody being gay, either famous or local? I don't know that I remember uh, hearing conversations about that. No. Perhaps innuendo. And um, I remember there was a, a, a game that the neighborhood kids played, including uh, myself, that would, I think, they used to call it Smear the Queer. Whoever had the ball got tackled and had to get rid of it. I, I don't know the rules, but um, I don't know that I identified that even as derogatory toward people who were gay at the time. When you were growing up, did you know anyone else that was gay? I, uh, no. Uh, I, I, people that, at, as time passed, turned out to have been gay, but not that I was aware of at the time. How old were you the first time you discussed being attracted to men with somebody else? Probably 24, 25. And, and how was it that that conversation happened? I was uh, completing grad school, MBA program at what is now Fisher College, and uh, had dated uh, a couple or three girls in succession in my undergraduate, and then I went pretty much straight on to graduate school, took a, a year off, which is a little bit unusual for business school. And um, had vowed to myself, so you know, this process of coming out, you kind of get it clear in your own head where you are, um, and then you have to figure, okay, now that I've got that figured out, now what? And that was a pretty tough transition for me. And so somewhere uh, when it, I really loved this girl, Susan, she was wonderful. And in fact, we occasionally exchange emails to this day. And, uh, uh, but it wasn't, you know, a long-term relationship or marriage wasn't in the cards for that. She didn't quite understand why, she thought everything was perfect. But I, of course, understood why. And to sort of deal with that, uh, I uh, went to see a therapist a few times. And um, so that's when I'm sure I would have had that conversation with someone else. What high school did you graduate from? It was a high school named Tenora High School in Northeastern Local School District in Defiance County. How old were you when you graduated? Eighteen. After you graduated, uh, what did you do next? I came to Ohio State and um, started my undergraduate. And what was your major? You know, it bounced around, um, but I spent most of my time pursuing a chemical engineering degree. Spent about three years and a quarter going down that path and uh, hit something called physical chemistry. and learned that I couldn't do the math required to do the physics and decided that I'd had enough. So I switched to business and ended up getting a degree in Bachelor of Science in Finance, Business Finance, um, with a whole lot of chemistry and physics and calculus and, and other things that most business majors didn't have. What was it like um, moving to Columbus for the first time? I loved it. Uh, being a superintendent's kid in a small town, um, I was always under the microscope. 
and always uh, felt as though I was taught to pay attention to what others would think, uh, the proverbial what will the neighbors think kind of uh, mindset. So uh, I actually was searching for a college where I could be anonymous. And Ohio State's about as good a place as you can find if you want to be anonymous. Uh, so that's why I, I, I thought it was great. What types of activities uh, did you get involved with at Ohio State during your undergraduate years? You know, I think I sang in university chorus a quarter or two, uh, did some intramural softball, maybe basketball. I had played a lot of athletics in high school, and I kind of missed that at the college level, but I had, you know, lettered in uh, cross-country basketball and track um, most years. And so I kind of missed the rhythm of an athletic season um, when I got to college. But in terms of activities, um, I would say I probably spent most of the time trying to figure out who I was rather than engage in a whole lot of organized activities. And being in chemical engineering, I carry a lot of classes. I think I averaged over the entire college experience about uh, over 18 hours a quarter. So it's a lot. When you were uh, completing your undergraduate degree at Ohio State, did you become involved in any, with any of the uh, GLBT groups or organizations or events? I, the answer is no, and I'm not sure there were any. And if there were, I wasn't aware of them. Um, I just remember very little about um, gay life at Ohio State between 1982 and 1986. When was the first time you ever went to a gay bar? Hmm. That would have been with um, my girlfriend Susan, who of course introduced me to the garage, and um, my roommate Jeff, who, on whom I had a crush. Uh, and we would go on occasionally to the garage or to Wall Street, uh, particularly on Wednesday nights, you know, the progressive nights. And, and so I think in my own mind, um, if you went to a gay bar with a, a girl or your girlfriend, you really weren't going to a gay bar. And if you went to Wall Street on, on uh, Wednesday night, that really wasn't either. It wasn't really gay night either. But um, that would have been my first experience with that. And what, what did you think of the environment? Uh, I, you know, um, just how a lot of people write about it, it occurred to me. It was comfortable and it... Um, it felt um, natural. I don't know if I'd go as far as to say it felt like home, but um, there was certainly a comfort level there. Except for when I was with Susan, and uh, that was a little bit of an interesting dance to try to play emotionally, because that was the same time I was sort of struggling with coming out, unbeknownst to her. Who was the first person that you had a friendship with that you confided in the fact that you were gay? Um, I think that would have been Danny, a, co a colleague and co-worker of mine at then Bank One in the late 80s. And, and how did that happen? Well, you know, I um, figured out that he was gay and uh, found a uh, uh, willingness on his part to sort of uh, engage me in the conversation about being out and otherwise. When was the uh, first time that you attempted a uh, gay relationship? Um, a gay relationship. You know, that's it's tough to say. There were people that I was attracted to and dated a few times. Danny would have been one of those. I don't know if he would have identified it as a relationship, though. Um, I met Myron, with whom I have now been with, coming up next week, 17 years, within about a year of coming out. So I really don't, you know, you know the proverbial closet doors came off the hinges pretty well in that one year between sort of coming out and not dating Susan any longer and meeting Myron. and. Um, it might have been 15 months altogether. Uh, so uh, I don't know that I had a relationship prior to the one I'm in that I would call that. How was it that you and Myron met? We met at the garage through uh, mutual friends. One of whom, by the way, 
was, uh, or both of whom were college roommates of mine who were coupled. And Steve and I had gone to the same high school together and uh, come to Ohio State as freshmen in 1982. When you first started um, interacting on the gay scene, mm -hmm. what were the options for gay people to hang out, meet, be social here in Columbus? Well, I think there were the bars, clearly, which is where I met Myron, and you know, I was pretty regular at the garage, as I recall, and not fairly regular at Wall Street, too, I think, for a period of time. And then um, I remember playing softball in the gay leagues, which was a good experience. Uh, that would have been probably like 91 to 93, somewhere in there. And uh, that was fun, played on a co-ed team, so it was nice to meet some women and not just gay men. But that was my experience. I think I went early on to an HRC dinner, and, which is you know, a once a year kind of thing. Um, but that's sort of my recollection of, of uh, the gay scene, if you will. How did uh, somebody find out where the bars were? You know, I'm going to guess that most of it was word of mouth. And then if you wanted to know some other things or find out where, you know, you, you vaguely heard of, you know, Tremont or um, uh, some of the other ones, Herbie's. Uh, you could go to Lavender Listings and get the addresses, I think. It was probably the best way, pre-internet. When was it that you first got involved with the uh, gay softball? I'm thinking it was uh, nine, the summer of 92. And the reason I think that's when it was is because I remember Myron was already playing. And I thought I could just take statistics and sit on the sidelines, but discovered I was way too competitive. And they decided they'd actually want me to play. If I was going to be that engaged in the game, I might as well be on the field. And so I think I watched in 91, maybe the summer of 90. No, probably 91. And played in 92, 93, and 94. What organizations are you currently involved with? Of any type? Of oh, gay organizations. Of gay organizations. You know, at the local level, I'm probably most engaged with uh, Equality Ohio. And then sort of national and less so in recent years, uh, Log Cabin Republicans, which I've been involved with in some capacity since, I believe, 1994. Uh, ending up on the national board of directors where I am now and uh, being the national board chair for three years from... I think 2002 to 2005, something like that. What has your involvement with Equality Ohio been? Well, I was at the, the organizing meeting and had been engaged in the precursor, the activities leading up to it around issue one. And uh, I think I was technically on that PAC board and fun, you know, participated in fundraising for it, and the outcome was the outcome, but it begot uh, lots of people who were passionate about doing something more, people like Lynn Bowman and Tom Grody and others. And so I was at the organizing meeting at King Avenue Church where they set out their strategy and their, their mission, which is in Ohio, uh, where everyone feels at home, and have supported them financially and offered my strategic insights where I could, having been part of gay organizations and building them and funding them and, and having some familiarity with how nonprofits work and board governance and being a sounding board, um, but have not uh, engaged in things like uh, being on their boards at this point. How was it that you first got involved with the uh, Low Cabin Republicans? One of my MBA classmates, Jerry Neal, um, was living on Hubbard and he was engaged in politics and he uh, hosted a reception in the back in his backyard. Now when would have this been? This would have been probably the summer of 93 or 94 and that sort of the, the genesis for uh, my engagement and for the Law Cabin Republicans activity in that time was a direct reaction 
to the 1992 Republican National Convention in Houston, which is the one in which uh, Pat Buchanan declared the culture war, or the war, uh, I guess, yeah, the, the cultural wars. And uh, in particular, singling out um, gay people. And there were a lot of us who, up till then, hadn't really seen laid bare that part of the Republican Party and didn't like it. And so uh, the response nationally was to create uh, local chapters. Now, Log Cabin has been around in California since the mid-70s, and it's uh, the event that sort of catalyzed or crystallized their formation was the Briggs Amendment uh, in 1977, which would have prohibited uh, homosexual teachers from teaching in public schools in California. And it was headed to passage until then Governor Ronald Reagan basically said, that's crazy, and uh, it failed. And so uh, that's uh, until the early 90s, Log Cabin was a federation largely with uh, chapters in California. After you went to the uh, reception at Jerry Neal's house, what was your involvement with the local Log Cabin chapter? You know, I was a member. Um, I supported it. I went to some of the events. Um, the, the county party led at the time by Michael Colley was very open and welcoming, and there were candidates that we could get behind. And um, then I ended up becoming president by default because the then president carried a, some professional licenses through his employment that prohibited that direct involvement in political activities. So uh, I think I was president from maybe 95 to 98, something like that. When was it that you got involved with the national group? I went to my first national convention, I think in Cincinnati in 1995. But I had lobbied uh, Congresswoman Deborah Price, to, if not her first term, her second term uh, in Congress uh, at a time where you know, she was you know, part of that uh, the, the, the freshman Republican wave of the early 90s and the Gingrich Revolution. And, and um, so I got to know some of the folks there on those annual fly-ins and lobby days. But I think I started going to the national events um, probably in the mid-90s to lobby, you know, whether it be Senator DeWine at the time or Deborah Price um, and go to the annual conventions, and I've been to so many of them now, but uh, Cincinnati, I think, was the first. And uh, what roles have you uh, held with the national organization? Um, regular board member, within two years treasurer, then vice chair, for a few years, then chairperson, and now I'm chair emeritus and, uh, until I resign or my successor uh, uh, leaves the chairmanship, I'm technically on the board, uh, at which time I'll go to a, an advisory status if I so choose. But uh, I think it's been, I think this is my ninth or tenth year on the board, three year terms. And uh, what, what have been either the most satisfying or some of the most satisfying things that have come out of your participation, either locally or nationally or both? Right. Um, at the local level, I am most satisfied with seeing that, in fact, it is possible for politicians to um, engage, move, and learn on issues of importance to uh, gays and lesbians. And I think Congressman Deborah Price is the perfect example for that. Uh, there was a time in the early 90s where sort of discussing out loud and using terms like gays and lesbians were, was, was difficult. And she was in an environment where uh, disparaging comments were made about gay persons. And just the act of, of saying, can you call people on that uh, when you see it? And uh, understanding that even that would, you know, in that environment and that time was difficult. And to see her progress to presently and most recently uh, you know, voting for passage of hate crimes. And she's been a supporter of ENDA for years and she will be the lead minority co-sponsor of the Employment Non-Discrimination Act coming up. So I feel really good about the, the, the demonstration that long-term engagement can reap benefits. In my role 
on a log cabin board, and not so much for the result, because I've actually mixed feelings about the result, but the process that we followed as a board to determine to endorse or not endorse President Bush for his second term was really quite rewarding. And uh, that took place in the same context as the Federal Marriage Amendment Act, uh, which I would be remiss if I didn't include that. Uh, despite uh, a great deal of rhetoric and energy from some quarters, uh, that really didn't go anywhere. And I think uh, we had a, a, a good um, uh, we had a, a, a good impact on it not going anywhere. We funded and a number of us stepped up and said we've got to do something more than we've done. And, and we had a great firm do the uh, ads that ran during the Republican National Convention. And they, the audience really were the delegates in Congress, not all the rest of us, but it was really the Beltway crowd where we used President, or Vice President Cheney's own words from the 2000 debate on Larry King Live where uh, he said basically, you know, states ought to be free to decide. You know, we're a free country, and I don't have the quote quite right, but it was pretty effective ad, and I felt good about that. But the process we followed as a board was really uh, interesting, and, and I'm, a, I'm a student of how organizations work. And we were able to navigate uh, that year through all the things that nonprofit boards have to do, budgets and membership and so forth and in parallel navigate this contentious issue of what would a Republican organization do in 2004 with the uh, endorsement or lack thereof of the president. And as it turned out, um, you know, my mantra to the staff was, which was led by Patrick Guerrero very ably, was you know, design a process that, you have, that has the confidence of the membership and that you have confidence in. And the outcome will be a competent one. And so they did some regional meetings, some town halls, we talked to a lot of folks, we engaged. At the end of the day, the vote was 22 to 2 to not uh, endorse or to withhold an endorsement from the president for various reasons, uh, not the least of which was uh, for many of us stepping over the line on uh, attempting to amend or advocating the amendment, amending of the Constitution. And um, that resulted in a quote from me on the front page of the New York Times, um, understanding that it was going to be a close election and you know, they were picking up all kinds of groups' positions on various things. How long did that decision-making process take? It took a good uh, six months. And as a result of that, were there people who opted to withdraw their participation or support? for the local or the national group? Um, there were, um, short answer is, is yes. And it did, and we knew it would freeze us out uh, even more so from the White House than we had been before. I mean, that's a White House that, that you know, rewards loyalty and penalizes disloyalty. Um, but all of the people, the, the thoughtful folks, not necessarily gay folks, but congressional people, people in the Hill, understood it was a position we had to take if we were going to have integrity as an organization. And what it forced for some people who left the organization was, um, and it forced the board into what I think, um, hopefully looking back, will be a very fundamental uh, discussion at a strategy session for the board held here in Columbus after the election, where we dealt with are we gay first or Republican first? And up until that time, we would have argued that it was a false choice and unnecessary and, and we're both. And the outcome of that strategy session was not that we're not gay or not Republican, but that when push comes to shove and there's a line drawn uh, uh, over which we can't stand credibly, that at that time we were gay first or Republican second. Let's talk a little bit about uh, your work life. Mm -hmm. After you uh, completed your graduate degree at Ohio State, mm -hmm. what did you do next? Well, actually, the graduate degree was an evening program, and I was working during the day okay. at that point at uh, then Bank One, which is really where I've been for will be 20 years this summer. Um, All right. What was it like as a gay person working in a corporate environment? <coughs> you know, I probably uh, was more 
uncomfortable than in retrospect I needed to be. There were uh, many gay people working at Bank One and affectionately some of us came to call it Bank One in Three, um, which was a little bit of an exaggeration. But there were many gay uh, and lesbian persons that worked there and being a, a major employer here you would see colleagues or other people from the company out at various events and so forth. So early on I was uncomfortable but you know when I came out I think I went to my first, uh, in 1992, I took Myron to the company Christmas party. You know, we were probably the only gay couple there. Then in 1998, as my career progressed and I was in a sales position and, and had done very well in 1997 or 1998, such that we qualified for, you know, a five-day trip to Hawaii with the other uh, sales leaders from around the country, Myron was my guest. To the best of my knowledge, we were the only same-sex couple uh, amongst, you know, 300 people that were there. Uh, and I found advocates in the legal department and, and others and have always been engaged in making sure behind the scenes, never really out front, that we as a firm were paying attention to things like our employment non-discrimination policy, uh, things like making sure there was a connection between what we said was important and what actually happened. Uh, so we've, uh, I've had really good fortune to be plugged in at the highest levels and at the company, even though it's when it was headquartered in Chicago and now New York, uh, with folks as part of conversations on things such as whether or not as a firm we should sign on to ENDA, what our position should be on state level legislation, how we can navigate those things, uh, educating uh, the executive ranks on how other firms have or have not successfully navigated uh, issues involving sexual orientation when they thought they had firm policy but when the proverbial shit hits the fan, you discover that maybe your policy is not as firm as you thought because the firm doesn't respond the way you thought it should or would. So um, my experience, in short, has been really quite good. Let's talk a little bit about uh, politics. Was your um, involvement with the local log cabin group, was that your first experience with GOBT-related politics? With GOBT-related politics, the answer would be yes. But I've always been a political buff. Um, I can remember watching the Watergate hearings on TV. I would have been eight or nine years old with my parents. Uh, when Gerald Ford was running for president against Jimmy Carter, I think my mother made sure that I saw both of them speak uh, You know, when they came to their various Northwestern Ohio stops. I went to something called um, Buckeye Boys State when I was in high school at Bowling Green and um, have a cousin uh, who's been in the House and Senate for now between the two, probably 20 or 25 years. Uh, he's term limiting out of the Senate at this point, Randy Gardner from uh, Bowling Green. And uh, in, I can remember seeing Ronald Reagan uh, campaign in uh, on one of his whistle stop campaigns in probably 1982 or 1980 it would have been 1980 I guess so I have followed politics a long time I mean I was probably the only person only freshman who went out and bought a book called the Reagan record in 1982 just because I thought that the rhetoric around his uh, economic policy was all wrong and I was a chemical engineer so that probably tells you something about why I felt I had to engage in the discussion. How was it that you uh, made the decision that you were a Republican versus being a Democrat? You know, I get that question a lot and um, I think the answer is I don't know that I ever made it consciously. It was sort of from where I come, you know, conservative Northwestern Ohio, uh, in the era in which I first had an opportunity to register was the Reagan era. Um, so I would have been in high school then, and the optimism that uh, he brought to the national stage politically uh, following the Carter years, uh, I think, uh, was appealing to me uh, as an 18-year-old interested in these things. And so it was, for me, there was never a, a serious conversation about, well, maybe I should be a Democrat. And I never felt that rebellious streak just because my parents were one, I had to be the other, uh, that some people seem to have. So, you know, there were times when clearly as I, 
uh, even in the 80s, I, I mean, I didn't come out until 1990, really New Year's Eve of 1990, uh, in, you know, that proverbial conversation with somebody else other than a counselor. And um, so I made it through most of the 80s, the whole AIDS era, sort of paying attention to it, but not relating to it personally like people who were out and active in the gay community were relating to it. And then in 1992, when you saw what happened at the Houston Convention, um, and there's really two options. You can stay and fight and do what you can, or you can bolt and, um, for greener pastures. And um, I chose to stay and try to make a difference from within. You talked a little bit ago, you, you mentioned uh, Jerry Neal, mm -hmm. and uh, you mentioned uh, Deborah Price. I was just curious for your perspective on, in your experience, who were either the politicians that you've seen historically during your time of involvement that have been supportive of our community, or gay people, other gay people who have been involved in politics, either as candidates or uh, behind the scenes making a difference? Well, you know, the, the candidates that come to mind as I kind of click through it, you've got, uh, you know, Jerry Neal was a, was a candidate, I believe. I don't know if he was in a general election candidate or a primary candidate, but I don't know who's a candidate. He ran against Mike Stenziano, Stenziano, didn't he? And Stenziano pulled the, you know, went anti-gay, ended up winning. It was a very dumb political move on his part because that's what led Amy Salerno to beat Stenziano two years later. And uh, Amy was, uh, I think, in, in total... She was very good on our issues. She disappointed a lot of folks with the Defense of Marriage Act vote post 9-11 in 2001. But uh, there were a number of things behind the scenes in committee work that most folks will never know about that she was quite helpful with. And in fact, that was an era when Joanne Davidson was Speaker of the House and pretty effectively uh, pent up the uh, growing frustration of why call the caveman caucus with their inability to move legislation that was important to them. I mean, here you had a, a female pro-choice, you know, moderate Republican Speaker of the House um, who for the longest time will every state, lots of states all over the place were passing anti-gay legislation. We weren't getting anything positive, but not were we getting anything negative under her leadership. And the reason for that is that the things quietly died in committee or didn't get reported out or weren't a priority of the leadership. And so that was quite helpful. Um, I remember uh, Jeanette Bradley being uh, helpful and candid uh, in, when she was on uh, city council and speaking out on do, uh, domestic partnership. And then Mayor Greg Lashetka was also very interested in uh, the broadest definition of diversity uh, in the city. Uh, which for him, I think from early on, included people who were gay or lesbian or uh, bisexual or transgendered. And I remember vividly um, when we held the vigil at the State House after Matthew Shepard died. And I called the mayor and said, Mayor, you need to be there. And you need, you know, when, when you craft your remarks and here are some suggestions, you need to say gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgendered and speak all those words. And to his credit, he did. And he got them all out, uh, which is better than a lot of the folks in our own community can uh, when they're speaking publicly. And uh, so he was helpful. So those are some names that come to mind, and I'm sure there are more. I have found more openness to dialogue than is perceived to be the norm amongst Republicans, even if the end result isn't a vote uh, in our favor. I really find very seldom the discussion to be uh, adversarial, uh, at least with the folks I was seeing. With, with the, the people that you mentioned, Salerno, Davidson, Bradley, Lashutka, do you... I need to add David Goodman to that, too. All right. With, with those people, do you know what their personal story is that allowed them to connect with our community, if, if they had some sort of a personal connection through a friend or family member, or just how it was that... what allowed them to, to look favorably on our community? Well, you know, I, my, I, I don't, I, the short answer is I don't know for sure. With the case of the mayor, Greg Lashetka, uh, he and his wife, and he raised his kids in German Village and uh, was, you know, active there, and I don't think he could have been active there in the 80s without being close to lots of gay folks. Uh, in the case of Amy Salerno, she was active, I think, in an early supporter of CATF, um, and, uh, you know, a, a, 
landlord and property owner with her husband, Joe Armini, of many properties in the short north. In fact, I think in a bit of irony, I think it's uh, her husband, Joe, who owns the building that's housed Union Station for the last several years. And it's, she's, you know, the short answer is part of the community uh, for those two. For Deborah Price, I don't know if there were specific folks, although I'm sure there were, but it was a pretty diligent uh, educational and lobbying effort. And early on, she had an openly gay chief of staff that um, I think had to be impactful to her on policy matters. Uh, and she had constituents, and she responds to constituents who are, uh, you know, aides. And, I'm, and the, I saw her every year for years in Congress when we call on her. But one year when I couldn't be there, somebody uh, who was HIV positive, and this would have been right about the cocktail era, you know, the, the onset of, you know, new hope, if you will. And he says, my parents are 60 and they're planning their retirement. I'm 30 and I'm planning my funeral. And that, you know, stopped her in her tracks. And when you have constituents who are willing to have those conversations with Congress people at the time on Ryan White, and some very arcane FDA legislation that would fast track certain things, um, that's not glamorous work, but really important if you're HIV positive or have AIDS and you don't have a cocktail solution. So, um, you know, those experiences, I think, after she was elected, uh, contributed to her uh, support for these causes. We, we talked a, a moment ago about uh, your employment and, and you indicated that you'd worked for Bank One. Uh, and, and, and then ultimately Chase. Yes, J P, and, and the part of the business that I'm in frequently understood is J.P. Morgan. There are two brand names under which the company operates. Chase is the retail brand, so it's what most people see is the credit cards at the banking centers. And the wholesale bank, which is investment banking and the private bank and the services for uh, high net worth and ultra high net worth individuals operates under the J.P. Morgan brand. Uh, All right, which I'm a part of. Walk me through just sort of a review of the different positions that you've held there. Right. I, you know, I started in a management development program, so I rotated to a number of things every three or four months for a couple or three years. Then I did some product management, which was really vendor management in the credit card business and sort of uh, managing the relationship between Visa and MasterCard and Bank One as uh, an issuer and a card processor. And then in the early 90s went into the trust business. Uh, it was a time when we were consolidating trust systems and worked for then presidents of the trust company on a variety of projects uh, and really got to know the nuts and bolts and how the securities business works, which was fascinating to me. Having had a, a finance background and, and sort of being quantitative in nature, uh, I really liked that. So I spent three years in what you might call securities processing, trust operations, and then uh, tired of that when I and I realized I needed a change when on a Martin Luther King holiday I received 18 voicemail um, in the heat of some uh, conversion activities and decided it was time to look for a different kind of role. So I say I traded in the expense budget for the revenue budget, moved downtown and took on some large uh, institutional custody clients. Uh, and custody is when you are accountable for holding the assets of a plan. So Public Employees Retirement System was a client, the Treasurer of the State of Ohio, Bureau of Workers Comp, some of the insurance companies uh, locally and some other uh, similar types of organizations around the country. So I did that in the mid-90s <clears throat> and then I went back into product management and it really had been in product management or staff roles since then uh, but for the last seven years focused on how to uh, ensure that we are uh, properly addressing the investment management related needs of public charities as well as the philanthropic needs of uh, affluent and, and wealthy individuals and families. How do you make that, their goals around that part of uh, the total suite of things we can do for them? Uh, so whether it be private foundations or introducing them to community foundations or donor advised funds or how it fits with their income tax or estate tax planning and the like. So it's become a fairly um, a sophisticated and focused effort of mine over the last three years really to zero in on that. You talked a little bit ago about the um, first time you had spoken with somebody about being gay privately, your, your friend, your mm -hmm. workmate. Tell me about the first time you stepped out on the public stage as a open gay person. You know, I think that would have been a 
Stonewall Annual Dinner, when Log Cabin received an award in the mid-90s, and the person giving the award was none other than Lynn Greer, who has since become a good friend of mine and somebody I respect a great deal, and, um, you know, very authentically, and so she wasn't being categorized, but very authentically would say, and I, you know, I think this is an oxymoron, However, we've got the, you know, the gay Republican group, Log Cabin Republicans, who's won this. And I think I accepted that was within the gay community. I don't know if you count that as being out. And then probably the being out in the non-gay community, other than at work, which by then had not become much of a secret. I accompanied Mayor Lashetka on a, diver, to a, 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 League, a National League of Cities diversity roundtable trip. Uh, and it included... Uh, disabled persons, uh, persons of various faiths, um, uh, racial diversity, and you know I was there you know, as somebody who identified as gay. Uh, and I think there were six or eight cities represented at this series of discussions and breakout groups. Uh, and he was president of the National League of Cities that, that year. I think that was 98, and this was in Wichita. So I think that was then. And then... Were you the sole gay contingent for the I'm meeting? I'm pretty sure, certainly for Columbus, and I think, as far as I know, for all the cities, because what struck me was that the cities that were there had and were dealing with a diversity focused primarily on racial diversity and economic, uh, uh, economic differences and economic injustice, and that... Lashatka had cast the widest net in terms of, of differences in trying to you know, forge a healthy discussion. Tell me about the um, first time that you ever attended a, a large march or rally. When that was and how that was. I think I went to the March on Washington in 1993. Is that the right year? You're shaking your head, so I think that, that that's, was the yeah, year. Yeah, that's, that, there were several, but I believe 93 as well. Um, and there was a march, and then there was the, an AIDS quilt event that I think might have been in 95, a couple of years later. But I mean, I still have my dog tags from the march. And what I remember is Ohio was way in the back of the line. And by the time we were, you know, quote, stepping off, uh, you know, other people were headed to DuPont Circle for some festivity or the airport. Um, but I think that was 93, March on Washington, and that was pretty empowering. And I remember I wasn't really out that much at work because it was a very sunny day, and everybody who went came back sunburned, and it wasn't sunny in Columbus that week. <laughs> so, so the question was, where have you been that you happened to get a sunburn? Um, and this was at a time when you just didn't jet off to um, you know, Florida or where have you uh, for you know, the weekend uh, to get sunburned. What was it like to be around that many thousands of other gay people. You know, it, it, there's no doubt it's empowering. There's no doubt that it is uh, eye-opening. And, you know, it, too often we forget that our own community is uh, not monolithic and is itself very diverse. And I remember seeing, you know, various groups along the parade route whose perspectives were uh, different than the majority, uh, whether it would be, you know, gays for, uh, pro-life gays, uh, or of course your political folks and various uh, things, but um, it, was, it was great. When we talked before about some of the different uh, GOBT groups and organizations that you've been involved with, why was it that you got involved with these different groups? What motivated you to, to care enough to... You know, I have, um, for the most part, been engaged in and wanting to sort of forge ahead with something. I mentioned I was in a lot of, uh, uh, lettered in a lot of sports in high school, but was also on, you know, the various um, uh, academic teams and so forth. And... Um, my, I think it's probably just part of the way I was raised. I mean, while my father was a school superintendent, my mother taught uh, season, seasonal farm worker children um, when they came to Northwestern Ohio to work in the fields. And I can remember she'd be saying, you know, uh, little Johnny doesn't have shoes, I'm taking yours. 
you've got enough. Um, and her parents were in the Salvation Army. I mean, my grandfather is the story that I'm told. You know, he was uh, assigned to the Bowery in New York City in the early 60s. Um, he had prison ministries in Pittsburgh in the 40s. Uh, my great-grandparents were accountable for the Salvation Army for, I believe, half of Canada when they came here from Wales. And so I have this long tradition, and even when I look at my cousins and my relatives, um, there aren't very many of us who ended up in a, in a classic corporate world. You know, most are teachers, ministers, uh, social workers, um, nursing home administrators. I mean, most of the folks in my family, um, a military in the case of one, uh, are engaged in some sort of public service. So it was just normal. And, um, you know, I've always felt that, you know, I could make a difference. And I think my father was a, a very good uh, role model in that. I mentioned earlier that I have a sister who was mentally handicapped. My father was a public school superintendent. You know, when she was born in the 50s, the guidance was to institutionalize her. And my parents uh, sort of vetoed that, knowing it would be unusual and so I was raised in a home with somebody, and she was not Down syndrome. And she's, I used to joke that she was much more socially adept than most of my friends, which continued through the high school years, despite the fact that her, her uh, disposition was that of a kindergarten or first grader. And, um, and so he was very engaged in, in all of the activities of how do you deal with uh, special needs kids in the public school system back in the 60s and 70s. And he didn't shy away from those things. Uh, it turns out, unbeknownst to me, in Williams County in 1985, in Bryan High School, um, when he was a superintendent there, it uh, became known that somebody had AIDS. And he was part of putting in place an AIDS policy in, in 1985 in small town, northwestern Ohio. Um, so I, uh, it just seems the right thing to do uh, if one can do it. And it's interesting to me. I mean, I don't have other hobbies. I mean, I don't collect cars. I do run. Um, I like to cook. But I'm not, um, I'm a public policy, current events junkie. Tell me about coming out to your family. Hmm. Um, it was tough. And um, I'm, I gave them all the clues that I wasn't gay. I mean, you know, I would take girls home and they'd be beautiful and... Uh, they would like me, and they would like my parents, and so um, when I eventually did come out, it was really tough, and I think my mother knew uh, in her heart, and I never really asked her, when did you really know? But when I finally came out, and I was at my parents' house, and I knew I was going for that purpose, and my mother laid out the question, you know, you know are you gay? And I said, Mother, do you want the honest answer? My father says, Honey, can you handle the answer? <laughs> And I told her, and it was, it was, you know, a lot of tears and crying and discomfort, and it was a day trip, which you can do, uh, which we still do to this day on occasion. But it was, and, um, you know, I remember that her saying, I rue the day I sent you to Ohio State, uh, thinking that it was, envir you know, purely environmental, um, but it was a complete upset of their expectations they had for me. And, um, and I at that time was probably 25 and I thought, well, heck, it took me 25 years to figure this out. I've got to be patient with my parents. And um, as time passed, they are wonderful. Um, they're on their way now as we're doing this interview. I'm expecting the doorbell to ring any time. They're here for Mother's Day. They'll stay overnight. Uh, they love Myron dearly. Um, my mother calls sometimes just to talk to Myron when I'm traveling. And um, Every year's gotten better and better. And um, did you tell your siblings at the same time, or I might have told my sister Brenda earlier, and you know that wasn't uh, particularly comfortable either at the time at which I told her she was uh, sort of becoming engaged in sort of you know the evangelical Christian movement, and uh, despite the fact that she had had. Uh, you know, an adult past that uh, uh, I think I don't know if she was on her second or second husband at the time that I came out to her. Um, it was 
you know, she too, despite the fact she was very smart, a couple of master's degrees, plus some additional college education, somehow just didn't compute that this might not be a choice. So it was tough. When you talk with uh, gay people, sometimes it's not unusual for gay people to talk about in school, people may have figured out they were gay and teased them, or later in life they may have been subjected to uh, discrimination or being picked on or harassment, whatever that might be. Do you have any personal experiences with anything like that? You know, probably the, the sad part is, uh, and, and you, you've always heard people say the folks that are most outspoken against homosexuality, you like kind of question what's there. I mean, why are they so frustrated with that? I'm sure before I came out, I could have been one of those folks. Um, you know, my two college roommates who turned out were having a relationship with each other unbeknownst to me and continued to for years after, after I came out, uh, I am sure I did not make their life easy. Uh, and I don't feel particularly great about that. Um, but nor do I think I was as vitriolic as some could have been or would have been. Now, personally, have I been... Um, I feel uh, like my experience, and I'm, everybody's experience is unique, but um, because of when I came out, I wasn't as impacted nearly as much by AIDS as some of my peers were. Like, I know a couple of people who died of AIDS. I know several who are HIV positive, for which today that's not the same situations it was 10 years ago, or, or even more than that. Myron, who's four years older than me, probably could name 40 people he knows that died of AIDS. He's just four years older than me. So first of all, that's the first distinction is that, that makes it different. Um, and then I guess, um, you know, sort of secondly, having been with the same employer for 20 years, have I been passed over for jobs? There, there might have been certain public profile positions that had I not been gay or I thought there might have been a, a more of an openness to having somebody openly gay in them, I might have pursued them. But I don't, um, you know, I haven't, I haven't had a bad experience in that regard. I mean, the occasional back, you know, walking down High Street in the 90s, somebody might, you know, yell fag out the window of the car as they drive by. Um, but I just really never let that kind of stuff bother me. You, you, you indicated a moment ago that uh, sometimes you ha may have had a, a negative attitude towards the idea of gays or homosexuality. Mm -hmm. How did you square that with going to the garage or Wall Street? Or did that predate that time period? I think it, you know, I was probably pre predated that time period. By the time okay. I was going there, I had ulterior motives to go. And I was seeing my college friends and others, in fact, one of whom had been married when we were in college. I'm like, oh, what happened to Karen? Well, we divorced and I'm with Jeff now. So, um, you know, that's uh, kind of how that worked. Even though I might have a, had my own personal discomfort with it based on my own situation, I'd like to think that I've always been one who was not uncomfortable with people who were different. And I attribute that to, you know, growing up with a handicapped sister in the house. And, you know, occasionally I'd come home from school and there'd be a birthday party there and there'd be wheelchairs and, you know, school buses with lifts. And, and um, it was a little bit different than most kids' upbringings. So. Let's just talk about uh, today a little bit. Um, any observations about how the world is different today than um, in the past? Um, it's tremendously different. Um, there, you, you don't have to, I would say, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, you had to go find uh, people who were gay or gay role models or read about them. You had to go out of your way to stumble upon them. Today, you can't avoid them. I mean, you, you can't channel flip and not come across Will and Grace or an old Ellen show uh, or other characters that include openly gay folks on TV. And although it's not perfect, uh, they're not um, the traditional stereotypes all the time. Uh, I think they're a, a broader representation. Now, we don't see enough. It's still predominantly white male. So we don't see enough, in my mind, of the sort of the diversity of the gay experience in, in, in the media. But that's probably the first and, and most obvious place. And secondly, uh, there are other folks who are increasingly coming out in, in uh, professions 
that uh, would have been unheard of uh, a while back. When, when you think about life so far, mm -hmm. what are the things that uh, you've been involved with or impacted that uh, you're most happy about or pleased with? Well, we talked about some of the work in the political domain that I feel good about. Um, but one of the areas we haven't spoken about that I've been engaged with since for about the last seven years is really the Methodist Church, and specifically King Avenue United Methodist Church. And um, I joined that, I think, um, May, December 30th, 2000, or two, December 30th, 1999. I was, it was sort of um, symmetrical for me because I remember it had, was 10 years from when I came out to when I sort of had found a church home. And it was interesting. I wasn't, you know, I, it wasn't like I was yearning for it. I, I thought everything was perfect, had a good job, good relationship, nice house, um, didn't have a lot of financial you know, stress in our life. Um, so I thought, like, you know, maybe I'll just try this out. And it turns out that I had sort of this blind spot, and I really was missing some sort of s spiritual wholeness that I found there and uh, got engaged uh, there. And what's been most rewarding, as I've seen that grow from the time when I joined, maybe averaging 250 per Sunday to 550 per Sunday now, is the growth of gay families. Um, and not just like the occasional special needs child adopted, but you know, two kids, and um, baptisms, and uh, you know, baptisms that have you know, the, you know, both parents, you know, both girls' parents or both guys' parents included. And it's not the gay church. Maybe a third of the church identifies as gay or lesbian, which means two-thirds don't. And the experience that the straight families have when they bring their kids in from the suburbs because they want them to be exposed to more diversity than they might get in Hilliard or Worthington or Dublin mm -hmm. is wonderful to see. So um, I really enjoyed that and parlayed some of my experience in the governance of the local church into some work at the conference level and now I'm, I'm engaged as the chair of the Council on Finance and Administration of the West Ohio Conference, which is 1,200 churches. And we'll be presenting to their, you know, sort of grassroots lobbyist group, which is really people who have the time to go, which are older on average, uh, at Lakeside uh, up on Lake Erie in June. I think there'll be 3,000 people I'll be presenting to. Uh, the budget. It's about a $21 million budget, and so I foster a relationship with the bishop. And, his, and the bishop's wife has been in our home, and uh, that's another part of the outreach I've done to a, to a community that uh, needs outreach on matters involving LGBT issues. Anything else I haven't asked you about that you wanted to talk about today? This has mostly been about me, and I've made several references to my partner, Myron. Myron Phillips, and you know, when it comes to sort of uh, the life I have, it wouldn't be the same, and it wouldn't be what it is, and it wouldn't be as fulfilling if it weren't for him. I mean, I've, we have really been blessed with stability. I mean, we've been together 17 years. I've been with my employer for 20. He's been in with his employer for 23. And the total time together, we've lived in two houses. Uh, we've gone through, you know, in my case, a, every year getting better relationship with my parents. In his case, his mother died four years ago. And um, the richness of the relationship we're in um, adds completeness to my life that I think would be missing. And so I would be remiss if I didn't um, acknowledge him and sort of the strength he gives me to do what it is I do.